everyone, and welcome to this week's spiritual gathering for Chuila UCC, and welcome to Transfiguration Sunday. My name is Jess Peacock, and I am the pastor here, and if you're joining us for the very first time, welcome. Now, next week is a very busy week for us, at least online, um, with the Ash Wednesday service on Wednesday and the ordination and installation service on Saturday. And everything you need for both of those services you can find on the launch page. Uh, and I will also be sending out emails as uh, the week uh, progresses. And if you want to see the ordination service, but you'll be, for whatever reason, unable to join on Zoom, I will actually be recording the service. And I'll post it as next Sunday's uh, spiritual gathering for Chuili UCC. So it will be available to you no matter what, if you want to see it. And also just a heads up that we will be doing communion today. Uh, my apologies for forgetting last week. Uh, so be sure to have your elements at the ready. And if you've never done communion with us online or you've never done communion at all, you are most welcome uh, to join. We'll walk you through it and you can use any elements that you like for the bread and the wine. You can use actual bread and wine. Uh, you can use pizza and soda. Uh, whatever you have available will suffice. And finally, before we dive in today, I just want to say to all of you watching that I am always available to talk about uh, the weekly messages. With doing things remotely, we lose that ability to hang out after a service and chew on things and discuss the ideas and the concepts that are, that are uh, covered each week. Maybe you loved something I said. Maybe you hated something I said. I think both are important to discuss. Because some weeks I want to comfort. But other weeks my goal is to challenge you and make you think. That doesn't mean you'll agree with everything I say. And I think that's okay. I know that's okay. Because the last thing I want to be as clergy... And the last thing I want others to be within the church is comfortable. I apparently caused a bit of a stir a few weeks ago when I used the organization of the Satanic Temple as an example of a potential prophetic voice outside of the, the Christian tradition. And I used them as the example because I wanted a group, I wanted to, as a, to use as an example a group as far from the Christian tradition as possible to wrestle with that question of whose voices can and should we consider as prophetic. I mean, if a Canaanite sex worker and a Babylonian king, a king who worshipped a god that came to be considered a demon by Christians, if these figures can speak prophetic words in the Hebrew Bible, then who else might be able to? If God is still speaking, as the UCC says, do we get to determine who God chooses to speak through? And my hope is that you were challenged to consider that very question and that you continue to consider that question in your everyday lives whether you agree with my example or not. So that said, I'm always available, always available to talk and chew on these weekly messages with you, whether by email or text or phone call. You may not always agree with me, and you don't have to. I may not agree with you either. It would get pretty boring if I wasn't challenging you and you weren't challenging me. But... At the end of the day, we are a community. And in a community, we're there for each other. Right? And with that, let's get into our call to worship, which is a call and response this week. And you can find that on the launch page. And your parts are in bold. There are times when the Divine Spirit calls to come and rest, to be at peace. Wisdom meets us like a friend, settling our anxiety and bringing us comfort. There are times when God comes to us through chaos and disorder. 
Love moves like a mighty wind, troubling all efforts to dominate and control. God brings stillness. God stirs up. God is restful and restorative. God is wild and disruptive. Let us welcome God in all their forms, trusting the divine spirit through confusion and clarity. Today's scripture passages are both being read from the Inclusive Bible, and the first passage is out of 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. When Yahweh was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here. Yahweh is sending me to Bethel. As Yahweh lives and you live, said Elisha, I will not leave you. So they departed together for Bethel. The disciples of the prophets in Bethel approached Elisha, asking, Do you know that Yahweh is going to take Elijah from you today? Yes, I know, Elisha replied. Now be silent. Then Elijah spoke. Stay here, Elisha. Yahweh is sending me to Jericho. And Elisha replied, As Yahweh lives, and as you live, I will not leave you. So they went to Jericho. The disciples of prophets in Jericho approached Elisha, asking, Do you know that Yahweh is going to take Elijah from you today? Yes, I know, he said. Now be silent. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here. Yahweh is sending me to the Jordan. As Yahweh lives and as you live, said Elisha, I will not leave you. So the two of them walked on. Fifty disciples of prophets stood off at a distance, facing the place where Elijah and Elisha stopped at the Jordan. Elijah took his cloak, rolled it up, and struck the water with it. The water divided to the right and to the left, and the two of them crossed over on dry land. Once across, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? Elisha replied, Let me inherit two-thirds of your spirit, he said. You ask a difficult thing, Elijah said. If you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours, otherwise not. As they were walking along and chatting with each other, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two, and Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father! the chariots and cavalry of Israel. And Elisha saw nothing more. Then he took hold of his clothes and tore them apart. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, to you, and to me. Thanks be to God. Our gospel text today is from Mark chapter 9, verses uh, 2 to 9. Six days after that, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain where they could be alone. And there, Jesus was transfigured before their eyes. The clothes Jesus wore became dazzlingly white, whiter than any earthly bleach could make them. Elijah appeared to them, as did Moses, and the two were talking with Jesus. Then Peter spoke to Jesus. Rabbi, he said, how wonderful it is for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter did not know what he was saying. So overcome were they all with awe. Then a cloud formed, overshadowing them, and there came a voice from out of the cloud. This is my beloved, my own. Listen to this one. Then suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, only Jesus. As they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus gave them orders not to tell anyone what they had seen until after the promised one had risen from the dead. The gospel it transforms. May it be so. Okay, now, close your eyes. And imagine for a moment that it's a beautiful and warm spring day, the exact opposite of what we've been in the last week. Just imagine this beautiful and warm spring day, and you're off on a hike with a few friends. 
Let's say that you're actually walking up Quartzite Mountain. And when you reach the top, one of your friends starts to unexpectedly glow a brilliant white light. And then two people who who were supposed to be dead, they suddenly show up and have a conversation with your friend who, again, is now glowing. How would you feel? Probably shocked, right? Maybe speechless, a little speechless. And I'd be willing to bet that if this happened to you, if this really happened to you, you'd probably be more than a little frightened, right? I mean, today's gospel text is one of those passages that we have read so often that it tends to lose almost all meaning or impact. So, just for a moment, put your feet in the sandals of Peter, James, and John. Scripture tells us that they were filled with awe which is probably an understatement for us today because when scripture uses the word awe, it's usually in scenarios where some pretty crazy and unbelievable things are happening. And I think the transfiguration fits that description. I would be willing to bet that this occasion filled those three disciples, Peter, James, and John, with unimaginable terror. I know it would me, walking through the woods with a friend and all of a sudden they turn into this bright light and dead people show up. And as they descended off of the mountain, they were probably even more bewildered to be told that they shouldn't even talk about this stunning event that they all had just witnessed. No explanation by Jesus about what the heck just happened. Just consternation and confusion and a bizarre mandate to not tell anyone about this, at least until the resurrection. And this tone here actually is a precursor to the original ending of this gospel, the gospel of Mark, where the women show up and find an empty tomb with the final lines from Mark Uh, chapter 16, verse 8, reading, They made their way out and fled from the tomb, bewildered and trembling. But they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Now, why is this important? Why should we stop to consider the fear and confusion that the disciples undoubtedly would feel in such a situation, that we would undoubtedly feel in such a situation? Why should we put ourselves in those shoes, in those sandals? Well, one of the things the author of the Gospel of Mark does through their writing here is present to us a God that at times can be confusing, that at times can appear frightening. In other words, Mark presents to us a divine figure that doesn't necessarily fit into the more romantic and safe sentiments that we tend to prefer in our conceptions of God and goodness. We can read all through scripture countless tales of the divine where God isn't always the light in the darkness whose presence makes everything neatly corrected and peaceful and calm. Whether we're pulling from the Hebrew Bible where Yahweh engages in a wager which costs Job everything he has, bringing him to a point where he, he asks God to unmake him. Or from the book of Acts, where Ananias and Sapphira are struck dead because they held back on a tithe and lied about it. They were, specifically, it says they were struck dead by God because they lied. Or even that ending of Mark, 
uh, before later writers punched it up a little uh, to be, you know, less depressing. The mission of God as reflected in Scripture isn't necessarily about positive energy and warm, fu- warm fuzzies all the time. Many of the biblical writers, and I would include the author of Mark in this, many of the writers don't present to us a God who is solely trying to make us feel better. It's not that God doesn't do that, but that a God who does, that's not their only goal. That's not their only job. That might not even be their main concern is our, is our feel goods. So often with scripture, we are forced to sit with this tension. We are forced to interact with and sit with a Job who loses everything, who wants to die. And when he asks God why they are doing this, Job only gets the reply of, because I'm God. Now, Some might consider the ending of Job to be a happy one. He gets his cattle back, he gets a new family, but I don't consider that necessarily a happy ending. It's a restorative ending, yes. Job builds a new life with his new family, but a new family can never replace the pain of the death and destruction that came before. I mean, we don't expect people who have lost a child to be whole again because they have another kid, right? So we have to sit with that very difficult tale and its repercussions and implications of the divine. And the writer of Mark is doing something similar with the the disciples here in the story of the transfiguration. They didn't expect the transfiguration. They weren't prepared for it. And afterward, they're told not to talk about it. So what is their choice? They have to sit with what they saw and what they experienced. For the original author of Mark, God's activity isn't solely about making us feel better. And the writer expects you and I, just like the disciples, to sit with that tension. And I think that is something that is lost within the contemporary church. We don't like unanswered questions. In some environments, we don't like questions at all. And we most certainly don't appreciate the difficult answers that don't necessarily wrap everything up into a nice and neat little bow. And too often we rush to mollify the difficulties of life with the pat answer of God is in control before truly sitting with the ambiguities and the difficulties and the questions of life that may not have easy answers. We are often in a rush to tame God. We seek to make God our personal good luck charm or self-help guru while forgetting the danger that God represents. And when I say danger, I don't mean danger as in God is bad for you, but danger in the sense that God does not equate necessarily to safety. There's a scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe by C.S. Lewis where Susan asks Mr. Beaver about Aslan, the lion. And she asks, is he safe? And Mr. Beaver responds with, safe? Who said anything about being safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he is good. God is not safe. God can be downright scary at times, but God is good. Even the most dedicated disciple might see God working and still be terrified. 
I am far from a dedicated disciple, but I am often terrified to be involved in the work of the divine. I was terrified to move here, to Chuila. Although some of you might not think that was God working necessarily. I'm terrified when I engage in social justice work. I was terrified in Portland when the tear gas started flying while working as a clergy observer during the protests there. I was terrified in Spokane while engaging with someone who was armed and yelling very unpleasant things at others during a BLM march. And in today's passage, you can't convince me that any of us in that situation on the mountain wouldn't also have been terrified. But Peter, James, and John trusted Jesus to lead them to truth through their fear and through their discomfort. In my experience, Christians tend to find fear, the idea of fear, problematic. Fear for many equates to not trusting God. And as a result, honesty and transparency within the church community suffers. We so often expect comfort from our leaders to be told everything is going to be okay without first going through the process of sitting with and sitting through dark and difficult times, the frightening times, the the difficult emotions, which results in believing that if, say, someone is depressed, then they just don't trust God enough. Or if someone's life is falling apart, they just haven't fully given their life and their trust over to God. Or that a pastor's job is to deny the reality of the world and conjure fluffy messages that make everyone feel good. However, by constantly trying to avoid the uncomfortable, the uncomfortable or the difficult or the depressing, we can easily miss out on the Creator's voice that also comes from the shadows as much as it comes from the light. And while it can be, oh, so very tempting to refuse to acknowledge the darkness or pretend that it doesn't exist, Quaker theologian Sandra Cronk writes in response to that, quote, at the center of our Christian faith is the place of darkness, emptiness, and knowing where we are stripped of being our own rulers and our own gods. In the darkness, we discover that not we live, but Christ lives in us, unquote. If we take the God of the transfiguration seriously, if we approach the divine not as a magic genie who miraculously transports us through the hard times with nary a scratch, but as the force that not only heals and comforts us, but as one that confronts us with difficult questions and truths, and yes, as one that can at times frighten us, then we can celebrate those frightening yet divine moments in our journey. We can sit with the dark times in our own lives, as well as in the lives of our friends and community, and still feel the presence of the divine in those shadows. And when we do this, when we let go of this idea of a safe God, in accepting that disruption and questions and even darkness have their place in our spiritual development, in opening ourselves to this, we are then transformed. Transformed in the care 
of the sacred, trusting in the care of the sacred, whether in the light or in the dark. May it be so. And with that, we'll move into our time of communion. And as you prepare yourself for this ritual, remember that the Divine Spirit seeks to be in communion with us. And the Divine Spirit desires that we be in communion with one another, as difficult as that can be during this time. God calls us from halls of power, from shelters and from the streets. God calls us from classrooms and from pulpits, from queer bars and retirement homes. The divine calls us as we are, from wherever we are, calling us to love relentlessly while walking on paths of uncertainty taking risks for one another, calling down unjust power from its throne and lifting up the lowly and the marginalized and the impoverished and the burdened. To answer the call of the Christ is to find ourselves, no matter where our social location, choosing to align ourselves with the causes of the marginalized and the oppressed and the outcast and the isolated with the faith that together we might give flesh to new possibilities of healing, of connection, of freedom from all that destroys. When these are the desires of our hearts, we open ourselves to that divine spark. And through this sacrament of communion, we affirm that we as a community are committed to the divine way of love and peace by our motives and our thoughts and our actions and our practices in this world. Through this act of communion, we seek to transform from within as well as without, to enflesh, to give flesh to hope and love and to realize the fullness of the divine that is among us. All are invited to this table of reconciliation. There are no exceptions. In coming together, let us recognize our responsibility in living in love and in peace with one another and all creation so as to be joined together as one sacramental communion of body and spirit throughout this earth. And on the night he would be arrested, Jesus gathered his friends and companions. In the midst of a frightening and dangerous time, they found each other at a table, connecting over the story of the divine that walked among them. And as they did so, Jesus took a loaf of bread blessed it, and broke it, like our world is broken. And he showed us the way to new life and hope by asking us to share our bread with one another in remembrance of his own example. Through the broken bread, we participate in and we become the body of the Christ in the world. In like manner, Jesus took the cup filled with the fruit of the vine, the vine that sustains us and links us to one another in troubled times as well in, as in good times, and he blessed it, and he asked us to drink of that same spirit of loving kindness and uniting harmony that was in him. Through this cup of blessing, we anticipate and participate in the changing and transformative life of the Christ in the world.
may it be so. Would you please join me for today's benediction? Dominance and control, violence and force. These are the tools through which evil moves. But God accompanies through a scandalous presence, vulnerable and free, courageous and collective, a holy togetherness, a sacred unity. God sends us to practice love that knows there is no peace where there is no justice. And transformation depends on discomfort and disruption. Open to sacred encounters, wild and unexpected. May it be so among us. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful week.